Thank you all for coming. Um, this is my second month just beginning in Australia. So I've just about got over jet lag, found a home to live in, found some schools for my kids, and done a little bit of work. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I have just arrived to start directing KIC, the Connected Intelligence Center at UTS, working um, with Shirley Alexander there, who's the DVC for education and students. And uh, we're going to be doing pretty much what you guys are doing. So all the, the most forward-looking institutions are setting up units like this now. Institutions are recognizing they need people who can think right at the intersection of computation, data, and learning. And it's not just computation and data, because that would just be analytics. It's got to be about learning analytics and connecting those two. And uh, something wicked this way comes is probably a good way of introducing it, because I'm also very interested not just in um, how, uh, how we figure this out as a wicked problem, if you're familiar with that term. A wicked problem is one where the stakeholders can barely agree on what the definition of the problem is, uh, never mind what might count as a solution. And every time you try and make a, an attempt at solving it, you actually change the nature of the problem. Uh, but I'm also interested in analytics that might equip our students to cope with wicked problems which is pretty much the only thing we can be sure they will be coping with in the future because of the complexity and uncertainty of, 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 of our society. So what kind of qualities do you need to cope with that kind of scenario? Um, so um, learning analytics, um, I've put in brackets and with a question mark in the future of teaching because um, uh, we don't really know quite yet what it's going to look like. But um, what I want to do is um, give you Two learning objectives that hopefully you will walk out by the end of today uh, with um, a slightly expanded vision of what analytics might be, um, as well as some new critical questions. Um, and um, this is going to be less a talk where I take you deep into any particular analytics technique. In fact, I'm barely going to talk about specific ones. You're going to hear about a whole bunch of different ones over the next two days. But I'm trying to open up a critical conversation about what we're doing when we create learning analytics. So I hope that that will complement the other um, presentations here. So I was uh, speaking at this event in Edinburgh um, a few months ago called Code Acts in Education. I heartily recommend you go there. Um, the slides will be available <coughs> afterwards, so don't worry if you don't catch the URLs. And um, Code Acts in Education was um, all about how is code shaping education from quite a sociological, critical stance. They invited me to go and talk about how does learning analytics shape education. And so I asked Siri to find me the website for it. Find Code Acts in Education, Siri, please. And it came back, searching the web for Code Accident Education. <laughs> and um, I love that. It just sort of summarized for me exactly some of the issues that, that people are, are worrying about. That um, algorithms that we are now increasingly carrying around in our pockets are crunching huge amounts of data. We're all very grateful for that in certain respects. The worry is, um, are we going to lose something important about learning by surrendering more control to <coughs> algorithms? Okay? That's, that's, that's a big concern for many people. Now, when, when the Chancellor announces the adoption, say, of a new economic modeling technique, here's our esteemed Chancellor, George Osborne, immediately met from the left wing, one might say, but not just the left wing, with all sorts of critical questions about this new economic model he was going to use to try and justify the impact of a certain policy. All right? And you know, you would have papers saying, watch out for Osborne's dynamic scoring we. So he was going to use something called dynamic scoring. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, here we have the Financial Times, not known for its left-wing leanings necessarily. But you know, we see dynamic scoring seeks to estimate the full effects of any tax change. It's controversial in the UK and the US, where it's backed by right-wing Republicans. Why would a modeling technique, allegedly an economically rational, scientific modeling technique, be backed by Republicans? Right. Few disagree the idea is good in principle, but many economists worry that the assumptions used are so optimistic the results are unreliable. Okay. So there you have, in, an, in a nutshell, the kind of question that a critical stance on any learning analytics approach will want to bring as well. 
if you are building a model that claims to predict the future, for example, <coughs> this student is at risk. Well, where did that model come from? So I'm going to try and unpack some of the issues about where did that model come from. Okay. And so when I ran a, uh, a panel at the, the LAC 13 Learning Analytics Conference uh, called Educational Data Scientists, a Scarce Breed, um, it was a, um, a lively debate where we talked about what kind of people are we trying to recruit in institutions now to do this. And John Behrens from Pearson, he runs their digital sort of learning analytics lab, put up a whole bunch of slides about things that make him crazy. One of them being when your, your data guys gives you some amazing sexy visualization or something. And John says, looks great at a high level. Have you explored it and tested the assumptions? What assumptions? says your techie back to you. And John was saying that's the difference between a data technician and a data scientist. A data scientist knows that any modeling technique is making a whole bunch of assumptions. You're, making, you're, you're adopting a worldview and you've chosen what to see and what not to see. I don't know what your Dutch is like, but you can probably figure out what's going on here. On the left, we have this uh, beautiful organic um, uh, life form. Uh, and on the right, we've analyzed it. <laughs> the Dutch, in fact, says, note the difference between knowing and measuring. Um, and this was in the context of hash learning analytics. Okay? So for many people, not necessarily uh, you know, technophobes, but they're asking a perfectly legitimate question, which is, when we start counting stuff at scale, automatically, possibly visualizing and feeding that back, possibly with a recommendation to an educator or even straight to a student, what, what happened? How did we get from that trace, from that learning that was going on, to a whole bunch of numbers, and then some pedagogical intervention on the back of it? Good question. So what is the core question for analytics? Well, here's my one-liner in the elevator when someone says, what do you do, Simon? Can we tell from your digital profile if you're learning? Okay. Amazon are trying to tell from your digital profile if you'll buy this toaster or um, would like to see this special offer, as is Tesco or you know um, Sainsbury's or whoever your big store is here. As every time you use that store card, we're not trying to sell people stuff, we're trying to get them to learn more effectively. But we need to unpack this uh, mission statement. Who's the we? Who is um, designing this stuff? Who is seeing this stuff? When they're presented with something, how are they supposed to read it? Um, can they be confident in what they're seeing? Do they need special training in order to know how to respond to some visualization that they've been presented with. Um, oh, and what is this digital profile? Um, it's, uh, it's something we, we talk about increasingly, but exactly how was that thing built? Looking at what kind of data? Why were you looking at that data? Um, and um, what happened to the, uh, you know, the rich context in which that data was generated? How much of that was preserved or not? And of course, learning covers a multitude of things. Um, within the room here, you will be all interested in very different kinds of learning, which would require very different kinds of support. Um, and likewise, the learners engaged in those kinds of learning may be very, very different. So from that simple mission statement explodes a wicked problem. Uh, of trying to figure out how one could make uh, in intelligent use of, of data. Now I'm going to flash just a few examples in front of you of learning analytics, and you're going to see many more. Um, it's just so that we are roughly in the same space. But the point is to make sure that you don't have a, a very narrow view of what we're talking about here, because you may have heard of one or two examples, and I guarantee that I'll show you some examples you may not have thought of. Okay. So it's, um, it's Dashboard City. Um, you can't buy a learning piece of software now 
without it counting something and giving it back to you in glorious Technicolor. All right. Um, so you can sort of let the dashboards wash over you. And, um, but clearly the question is, well, what's, count, what's being counted? Um, is it useful to present it back in that way? Who's supposed to read it and what are they supposed to do with it? Intelligent tutoring has been around for a long time in the research literature. It's now out of the labs and it's in products under names like Adaptive Learning, companies like Newton, Grocket. Um, the big publishers are buying adaptive technology to present and customize the presentation <coughs> and your experience, depending on what you master or what you don't master. And there are some quite impressive results coming about out from the researchers who are actually bothering to evaluate it, like um, the team at Carnegie Mellon University who have developed, say, a statistics tutor. And, and so you analyze in very great detail, what does it mean to master statistics? This is like Statistics 101. You know, if somebody can't do this, they decide we really shouldn't take them on to the next step. How can you tell um, whether, they've, whether they've mastered it or not? So they've analyzed to death what it means to master some introductory statistics. And then you can build a very powerful platform that builds a model of the student. And it, it says the student can do this and this, they can't do this, let's repeat that exercise, only when they pass that will we take them to the next level. And you get mass customization. And for example, students were shown to learn a full semester's worth of material in half the time, doing at least as well, if not better, than students learning tr in a traditional way. So when you use that tool plus a blended, a blended mode of delivery, that's a pretty impressive result. Most people would want to sit up and take notice of that. But it's labor intensive to produce an environment like that. Most universities could not do that on their own. But for example, this is um, an open educational resource. Um, or you would want to contract with a company like Newton, or unless this isn't an advert for Newton, there are others out there, of course. But the point is, it's labor intensive to do, but it works for certain kinds of learning. A very different example, I'm working with uh, Xerox Research Center in Grenoble. Um, they have developed a rhetorical parser that looks not at are you talking about the right things, but how are you talking about them, and are you making your thinking visible in your writing? Something we, work, we spend a lot of time trying to teach students, how do I make my thinking visible in my writing? How do I learn to write in the, the way that will become recognized as academic and scholarly in my field. Okay? And so you can see that the PASA here, and this is work I'm doing um, back in the OU with a PhD student, Doi Gu Shim Shek, um, using the Xerox incremental PASA, ZIP, and we are creating a dashboard. There's a link there you can follow up later. And you can see the PASA is picking out that it's as, it has classified these two sentences as contrasting ideas in some sense, because the linguistic parser has picked up that the student has talked about the problem with this method, dum -de -dum -de -dum. Um, another problem with this method is, right? Now that's quite an easy example because we're talking about problems. But you might be contrasting Smith and Bloggs and the fact that their two predictions are inconsistent. Um, here, in conclusion, I would suggest that such a method would be dum -de -dum -de -dum. So the parser says this looks like a summary statement of some sort. Okay, So if you put that through a, a web service and it came back in you know, one second, it's analyzed your draft paper for the conference or your draft essay. And it's highlighting passages. It's not grading your essay, but it's saying these are the passages I found that look significant and salient from an academic writing perspective. So we are trying to validate this right now. This is like a raw technology developed an industry by people who know nothing about learning or higher education to do enterprise analysis of, of the knowledge level claims being made in an enterprise context. But we're very interested in this from a perspective of our students learning to make their thinking visible in their writing. Here's another example from a, a knowledge mapping environment called Cohere that, that my team developed at the, at the OU where you don't engage in a discussion forum in the traditional sense where you have threads or just flat comments. You build moods 
in a more explicit, reflective way. Um, so you can see that um, different people have been making certain kinds of claims. So this is consistent with that. This idea challenges that one. Okay. That's pedagogically useful and interesting. Um, but also enables all kinds of analytics you couldn't do before. So it's now very easy to ask who disagrees with this idea. Try asking that of a Blackboard forum. Right? It's just incredibly hard to answer a question like that. Um, and so you can see that um, Rebecca, whose avatar is here, is playing the role of a broker, which is an interesting role to play in a community of inquiry. Because Rebecca has connected two different people's ideas in a meaningful way. Or, rather than recommending people like you that you might like to follow, well, now we have the basis for recommending people not like you. That's important in a learning context. You need to collide with people who disagree with you as well. So the fact that the system has access to the semantics of the relationships enables new kinds of analytics that would have epistemic value, arguably. Here's a very different example. Um, here... This is from a LAC 14 paper from the Learning Analytics Conference. Spatial clustering. Basically, you've got three students who are organizing electronic sticky notes into affinity clusters, which reflects their understanding of how concepts group together. Okay? They then share that, and the algorithm is simply taking that and trying to produce a class aggregate picture, um, which the teacher then uses as a catalyst for conversation about how did your clustering compare with what emerged from the whole classes? Okay? So there's no, there's no scoring going on here. No one's trying to grade or predict a student at risk. The algorithm is simply trying to take a non-verbal kind of layout, which we're all familiar with as sticky notes, and then provoke a pedagogically useful conversation. And here's a final example just to stretch your minds. You send students out on a field exploration they're examining trees. Some students come back and they barely looked up. This is a system that's analyzing posture. Right? So we're now talking about embodied learning. And the, what could you tell by the fact that some students spent a lot of time down on their knees, burrowing around near the roots of the trees, and were looking up a lot, and took notes on their iPads or whatever. And some students just walked around and barely thought it was important to look. So just to stretch your minds about what analytics might mean, if you can take a technology like that and bring it in to add value to the feedback you give to the educator and the students, you know, this is the space we're moving into. Here's another one. Not esoteric technology at all. WordPress, but with a bunch of plugins added uh, by us, driven by a whole theory of learning dispositions. That's mindset. I haven't got time to go into that in detail today, but I'm happy to chat about it more. Basically, when you write a blog post, you also categorize the blog post against seven dimensions of learning. For example, I, I think that right now I'm reflecting on my learning and I believe that I'm reflecting about how resilient I was. Or um, I'm reflecting on my learning and meaning making is the ability to see the connection between what you're doing now and something you learnt about in a different context. Okay? So these dispositions, and there's plenty to read about these if you want to go into them in more detail, Simon mentioned them, are examples of an evidence-based approach to thinking about 21st century learning skills. Okay? Transferable competencies uh, which allow you to reflect on how you learn and how you respond when you're stretched and challenged out of your comfort zone. And when you blog and simply categorise your blog posts, it generates this visualisation. They go from red to amber to green. And then the teacher, this is taken from my primary school, where we're doing this with 11 and 12 year olds, gets a dashboard who can see at a glance. It's not a score, but this is how the pupils are reflecting on their learning as they go through an inquiry project. Um, every student was doing a different inquiry project. How's the teacher supposed to keep track of that? Well, this is one overview approach. Different visualizations that show the extent to which different students are reflecting on things. And you click on one of these, and you can go straight to where that student, all the blog posts tag resilience, for example. Okay? So pretty low-tech stuff. Okay? 
But, and this is where we come to the sort of uh, critical but bit, um, it's not as simple as just creating some interesting new technologies and trying this out. We need to think about the fact that we are inventing new ways of measuring and making things visible. And that can start, as we all know, from high stakes measures to shape the activity that it's supposed to be describing. Okay? So a quote there from economists, which is not going to be very surprising. We start to shape the reality we're trying to measure when those measures start to become visible and have high stakes consequences. So the question then is, well, in what senses could or do analytics shape the reality that they measure? Because we can't come into this with our eyes shut. And so very quickly, whether we're talking about national or international PISA type assessments, or whether we're talking about within an institution, supposing learning analytics start to come with rewards and whatever the opposite of rewards are. Okay? That's political now. Okay? So any leadership needs to be aware that as soon as analytics start to have consequences, you've got a political tool at hand, and you're going to start changing people's behavior. And of course, the art is to try and change people's behavior in a way that's A, productive, and B, that they actually buy into, because there's that word that was mentioned at the beginning, trust. Do people trust the analytics? If the educators don't trust the analytics, if the students don't trust the analytics, you end up <coughs> gaming the system and you get camouflage behavior where you simply tick, try and tick the right box. Where you end up doing weird, bizarre things so that your graph looks right. Okay. And then we've lost the plot at that point. Analytics shape education ontologically in the sense that what does the analytic tool represent what can you model and what can you not model and i put up you know here's an example from the uh, very high stakes english primary school exam results if you go into the red for too long as a head teacher you will lose your job it's very simple we have such a punitive regime in the uk now you need leaders with great courage to innovate when the graphs could go red and you could lose your job Here's a, feed, here's a display from Grocket, which helps you pass your standardized tests in the States, talking all about your verbal ability. That's one of these adaptive platforms I showed you earlier. There's the dispositional analytics from the work that Ruth Deakin Crick does at Bristol, who will be out visiting me for the next two months, October, November. We're talking here about learning to learn. And here's another system um, I saw, you saw a glimpse of that in the Cohere visualization. Here we're talking of the system understands that people can ask questions, post ideas, and agree and disagree with those ideas. Right. So we're talking about a world, different worlds completely here. And so ontologically, if you decide to model discourse using this, you, know, you are ruling out other kinds of moves. If you decide you're going to study verbal ability in reading and writing, well, you're measuring it in the following seven categories or whatever it is. Okay? So you are choosing to be blind to certain things, but paying attention, hopefully, to the right things. And so this great quote from Jeff Bowker and Lee Starr in their fabulous book, Sorting Things Out, is that any classification means you've got a warrant for forgetting stuff as well as for, for tracking it. Okay? And their fascination, then, is with what gets coded out in the standards that we have. What happens when this sinks into the infrastructure and becomes invisible and is just part of the learning system? Um, Candace Thill at CMU, no, she's now at Stanford, says, you know, as we move into online learning environments with analytics, is higher education in the process outsourcing its core business to software developers? Right? If these tools are now claiming to tell you who's learning and who's not learning, we've just outsourced something quite important there. And we need to know what kinds of questions to ask uh, when, when the vendor rolls up with the dazzling dashboards. Neil Selwyn at Melbourne. All of these processes are intensely human, value-laden decisions. Nothing neutral about those, coming from a critical sociological perspective. And so when you get a visualization like this that claims to show which students are progressing 
or falling behind or slow moving. That's nice visualization. It shows you at a glance how many light blues you've got and how many, um, how many blacks you've got, etc., and how many pinks. But if we zoom in on one of those students, for example, who is in a terrible home situation, you can barely keep him at school, usually trashing the classroom, he might have been making huge progress in all sorts of life skills. He may even be coaching his peers in a way that he couldn't imagine at the beginning of term. But he's invisible, or rather he's not invisible, but he's just a pink blob falling behind. Right? What you code is what you value. And I think one of the uh, exciting things about analytics is that it may provide us with a way of coding and measuring things that we've always known were important that we never really knew how to do very well before. So maybe that analytics give us an evidence base, finally, to value some of the things we've always known were really important and which will become increasingly important for our very complex society and put it on a firm evidence base that allows us to actually show we have moved the dial, whereas the previous <coughs> assessments we had just couldn't, couldn't see that. Just to mention that whenever you're modeling anything, there's a question about what grain size you use. So as, as we try and make sense of discourse, all the writing and discussion that's going online, and we're putting machines to work, trying to analyze these transcripts, we know that a machine and a human doesn't read stuff in quite the same way. So there's a very live issue about how machine learning relates to the way that humans make sense of, of, of text and discourse. So there isn't time to unpack that, but people like Caroline Rosé um, at CMU, our leaders in that field. And then as we shift to interest in collective intelligence and your ability to work as a team to solve a problem, we're not just interested in the isolated individual anymore. So how do we sh demonstrate shifts in group knowledge construction and performance, not just the individual? And uh, uh, Monica Resendez and Bodong Chen from uh, Toronto, OISI, had a, a nice paper at LAC about that. So I'm just flagging, you know, big issues, each of which is like a whole interesting research stream you might want to unpack. Algorithms are clearly not neutral. Um, all sorts of decisions have been made about the thresholds, what's going to get sampled, what patterns are important. Um, you know, so as we, as we come across uh, mathematical formulae, some of you in the audience are equipped to read this and some of you are not. But learning analytics is a transdisciplinary field emerging where an educator needs to know what is that saying? What, is the, what judgments is that going to make about my students? Does that correlate to what I think good learning looks like? So that's a, a model, an AI model about what it means to engage in a good deliberation process developed at MIT. Right? They've got a whole bunch of analytics that say a good deliberation process is one in which there is full coverage of an idea space. There's a diverse range of ideas. It's not dominated by a narrow range of ideas. And we're going to invent analytics that spot the following patterns that correspond to a narrow range of ideas. Okay? Very interesting approach. I'm working with these guys. But clearly, someone's decided what counts as quality deliberation. And just to flag that, of course, the, the neutrality of algorithms and the effect that they have on our society is not just limited to learning. Um, it's something that comes out in all aspects of society. So if you go to governingalgorithms.org, they talk about things like this. Bias, values, how inscrutable algorithms can become. Um, who's got the agency when you've got machines crunching data and making decisions off the back of them. All good questions to ask in an educational context as well. How do analytics shape learning semiotically? Because at some point, a human being has got to see what's going on in the machine. That must be made visible in some sexy graphical way. right? But what does this mean? What pattern should I look for? Do I need training to understand whether this is at the right gradient? Or you know, why is Kate Johnson in the red here? Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, in this visualization of what's going on in a community of practice, how do I know that you know, this person is a lurker and what should I do about them because they're not engaging? So the way in which we present stuff is as important as the underlying algorithms, of course. 
excitingly at a systems level, we may be talking about making the whole sort of ecosystem more sentient. Okay. As every agent in the system becomes more aware of its environment, more able to respond in a more timely manner, the whole system is kind of increasing in intelligence in theory. Right? That's a complex systems um, type approach. So instead of forming an intent and hoping that some outcome is happening and, and sampling at a relatively infrequent rate, we are now increasing the speed and the resolution of the feedback loops. Feedback loops to the people who created the learning experience, but increasingly feedback loops to the people in the experience up there. So when the student starts to see feedback about their performance, just like you do when you look at your running app or your diet app or your, your fitness band or your, your sleep app even, right? you're feeding back and you might change the behavior in the process. Obviously, you hope you're changing the behavior in a more productive rather than less productive way. And so there's a real issue about authority to interpret, to define this, and to interpret them. So can we imagine devising analytics in a participatory way with teachers, with students? Who gets to interpret the analytics at what level? Who gets to see the big picture? Does the student get to see what all their peers are doing? Only the educator? If you showed the student what their peers are doing, are there ethical issues there? How do you do it in a motivating way rather than a way that's just going to send them into despair? Lots of interesting issues there. And analytics will never escape the magic triangle that's hardly new within the world of education <coughs> around epistemology and assessment and pedagogy. So it's great to hear that what's going on here is taking a kind of whole systems view where you realize but, you know, you've got your smart learning program. Is that what it's called, smart learning? Smart something, right? right? Which is all about shifting pedagogy, shifting what does it mean to know something? How are we going to assess that? Because that opens up the space for these new technologies, especially ones that track process and dispositions and these other things, to actually take root. Um, so, you know, learning analytics is firmly in the middle here. You could use analytics to optimize and deliver a hugely instructivist pedagogy. Because you've decided that the only thing that needs measuring is this sort of thing. And that may be suitable for certain kinds of learning. Other kinds of learning, what do constructivist analytics look like? Okay. So, just to wrap up quickly then, you know, here's a nice simple example that my colleague Doug Clough at the OU said, okay, here's analytics, you have learners who create data, which you then measure in some way, and then you do something about it an intervention. And the point I'm making is that this whole cycle is infused with human judgments, educational values, and, um, and, and ethical dimensions. So when the data pops up on that glorious dashboard, you know, it didn't appear there by magic. A whole infrastructure has been created by people who know more or less about learning. And data does not speak for itself in any sense. That would be such a naive perspective. But you hear that kind of rhetoric a lot. Big data, now we can finally see what's going on. Well, yes, but. So analytics shape learning profoundly at many different levels. And the conclusion really is that um, we can't avoid that. It's a tool of the job. It could change the way we see what's going on. But we have to make sure we're walking in with our eyes sort of wide open and that, that what we're doing is intentional um, and not accidental. Thank you, Siri. And so the question then really, I suppose, for CSU is what kinds of learning are you optimizing for? And the answer will not be one answer. It's going to be a whole range of answers which will have different kinds of analytics or so approaches associated with them. And, you know, what is the vision of the future CSU graduate? There may not be an easy answer to that. Or you may already have a whole bunch of qualities that you want to see graduates walking out with, which will make them more employable. And I think it's a frontline analytics challenge to develop analytics for some of those graduate qualities. So just to know more, there's solar, solarresearch.org. That's where we are trying to lift the level of discourse within universities amongst leaders, technologists, educators. 
come to upstate New York next March for the International Conference. And, uh, and you'll find this a place which isn't just talking algorithms and data and computer science. This is where we're trying to create a real multi-level conversation from the DVC, who wants to learn more about this and talk about policy, all the way down to people who are testing new algorithms and trying to generate new visualizations and think about where pedagogy fits in here. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much, and, and um, I hope that provokes some thoughts.